Uzo Emetu is the founder of Black Oak TV, a streaming service that brings underrepresented voices to the forefront. The goal of this subscription video platform is to feature more diverse content that serves the serves Black audiences. No strangers to streaming technology, Ometu's prior position was with YouTube, where he helped the company partner with streaming agencies. He sharpened his technical digital media and marketing skills under the Google umbrella and several media companies such as Inc. Magazine, ESPN, CBS, and Morpheus Media. A graduate of Columbia University, Umetu's vision for Black Oak TV is to support independent filmmakers and put creators and audiences first. Please welcome Uzo. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. You have a storied background in media and technology. Who or what encouraged you to focus your life on this career? To be honest, I think I got here kind of by happenstance. I have always been interested in things related to entertainment, media, storytelling. I think growing up, the things I were most passionate about included sports and writing and, and books and watching a lot of television and movies. And so I went into college and I think I thought I was going to be a doctor and then maybe even closer to that, I thought just in general, wanted to be a businessman, an entrepreneur. And at some point in college, I started to be exposed to different things. I got an internship at Viacom and MTV. I got another internship at a music label, small independent music label. And then on campus, I ended up working for the school newspaper. I put on a show there for the black students at Columbia University. And I even tried to get a radio show, but my application got denied. So that was unfortunate. <laughs> but yeah. And so after that, like after all those experiences and kind of the rise of Journalism wasn't necessarily doing that well because of newspapers, but you were seeing more voices on TV and radio really starting to come out, and especially as the internet was starting to ink, starting to help with that a little bit around 2005, 2006. And so I decided I wanted to go into journalism. It kind of combined my interest in all of these things, storytelling, media, together, and that's where I kicked things off. And Lo and behold, that would take me down the path of really being not just interested in the stories themselves, but also the business of creating stories, distributing stories, monetizing stories, and working with writers and artists and creatives. So, yeah, I'd say that's kind of the genesis of, of my career thus far. Featuring underserved voices is a no-brainer. And it's a no-brainer that media and streaming services need to change. How has working at Google and YouTube helped you find that niche you needed to make this a reality? You know, I don't know if it's a no-brainer. Like, I think it's because it's a hard <laughs> thing to do. It, well, it's hard. Like, it's the no-brainer in that, you know, obviously underrepresented voices want to be fully represented. And we should want to make sure that they're represented. It results in better things for the community, for the country, for the world. And there is money in it if you are able to crack the nut, for lack of a better term. And so for those reasons, you could say it's a no-brainer, but I would say like it's not, it's not easy, right? Like if it were easy and obvious, then the places that I've worked at, the media industry in general, they would be all over this. They would be doing this time and time again. And the truth of the matter is when it comes to content, like the best way to monetize it is to have something that costs as little as possible and reaches as many people as possible. And so by definition, if you're working with minority groups, they don't reach as many people. Those stories don't necessarily reach as many people as a story about majority groups does. So it, from a math standpoint, it's difficult to do sometimes, but obviously it can be done. It should be done. 
we're trying to do it. And I think in terms of what I learned from these prior places that either had good intentions or tried and failed, I think the main thing is that you just have to be 100% focused on it. So you have to be able to see through the difficulties of serving underrepresented audiences and understand that on the other side of those difficulties are the no brainer opportunities and that you know there is demand, there's not enough supply out there and you know this is the right thing to do and that you will be rewarded if you can figure out what your path is to that. And so that's why we launched Black Oak TV is because I looked around and there just weren't a, the, the big companies were not 100% focused on Black audiences. And if they weren't, I didn't think we were ever going to get our just due because of the economics and math of the situation. And so I knew a company needed to be 100% focused on this. And so that's what we're trying to do at Black Oak TV, be 100% focused on Black audiences and Black stories. Let me preface this a little bit too by looking at, maybe it's because of the internet and YouTube, <laughs> YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. When you look at content from say Japan and Latin America, <clears throat> and you look at the views on even just the most mundane of all content that's on there from those communities compared to North America, it's not even a comparison. The view viewership is just drowns the viewership from certain content on North America. We're seeing with other streaming services where like Netflix, where they are bringing in more other countries to create. So is this something that is making it under representative in the sense that they're not looking past their own borders or clearly we need more voices. We need more directors, even just female and all cultures, Asian, every community, we need to have our media represent what we see outside of our window. But mm -hmm. do you think it's also kind of like small mindedness where we're not really looking at the big picture and the big picture is not North America, it's really global. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you're certainly right. There is a lot of awesome stuff happening outside of our borders plenty of amazing artists and content creators and particularly music that is starting to become a much more global phenomenon. I think at the end of the day, like with so many things in America, we are just so American focused. And I think that is in part because the my understanding, being the little bit of a media historian that I am, is the real growth and corporatization of media to the masses started with America, started with Hollywood. That is when the globalization or the corporatization of content really, th this is where it began. And, and thus a lot of it is American centric. A lot of it starts here. Hollywood tries to influence the globe with content from America. And so I think for that reason, we still have to break out of that box a little bit. And then when you talk about what's happening on the platforms, most of that is still borderized to some degree. Like the algorithms at these places try to drum up localized content for you with the belief that that's the thing that you're most interested in. Now, of course, sometimes you have things break out of that. And, <laughs> and, right, and you have global phenomenons, but you know, the platforms are trying to localize your content to some extent just because they generally feel and the research shows like that's what most people are going to be interested in. But I think at the end of the day, when you go outside of your borders, you're generally talking about different cultures, different values, different stories. And so I think it's still very important that within our own borders, and to your point, everyone is telling their stories because, you know, the story of a Black person in America is very different from the story of a Black person in France or in South Africa or Nigeria or Brazil. And so those folks are going to have different experiences. Now, it doesn't mean we don't share a common bond, the diaspora, and that goes with Black cultures, other cultures as, as well. But I think within your own bounds, you still want to have your specific story told and seen and heard. And I think that's essentially where a lot of the angst and, and criticism comes for Hollywood when it comes to 
properly representing these folks is that's a necessity. But even when you go globally, you're talking about different production values. You're talking about different yeah. volumes of stories. So even there, you're still seeing some some issues across the globe. And they also have the same issues that we have in North America as well, that we, mm. that underlying thing that kind of keeps this content from surfacing. <laughs> right. It's, how do you vet your creatives? Has it been difficult to find the right creative that produces programs to mirror your image on Black Oak? To be honest, we're still trying to figure out exactly what our image is. I think our goal is to kind of be the, the HBO for Black people, to have that brand, that type of content focus. But I would say the more we do this, the more we realize the ways we need to be different in that aspiration. So I'd say our vision is slightly shifting away from that to some degree. I can talk about that more. But in general, when we're looking for creators to be a part of Black Oak TV. My main goal is mainly just to start with the people that I think are creating the most amazing content, the most interesting stories, unique stories, the ones that are able to bring high production value at a relatively low budget because we don't have that many resources. And to see the folks that are really good at just telling stories. So before I even start with, hey, we're looking for this specific type of film or TV show, or we really need something that is a comedy or sci-fi, I really just start with, hey, is that a good piece of content? And it's a subjective thing, but you know, if we're just taking a look at the writing, the work they've done in the past, the comments from the viewers, any awards they've won, how it just strikes me and my team we're really trying to measure those things. And if it's really good, and if it's one of the best things that we're seeing, we're going to try and figure out how to get that on, on Black Oak TV. And hopefully, and, and the way that I think we can really be like HBO is that that's what I generally think HBO is, right? I think they are a brand that has said, we do everything, right? We tell Game of Thrones stories. We tell stories about corporate media. We tell stories about the living dead will go anywhere, but we're going to tell these stories in an amazing, creative, unique way. And I think that's what we're trying to be. Ultimately, we'll be a little bit different, but I think that is a big part of the vision for the types of shows you will see from Black Oak TV originals. Yeah. And it's not just originals that you produce or show on Black Oak as well. You have other content from other creators that you just bring in as well right otherwise it could be a very expensive venture <laughs> yeah so yeah like most streaming services we have the content that we exclusively produce commission or license and then a lot of our film the bulk of our library is actually content that we've licensed from other content creators that have been created for other platforms other distribution methods and we do some type of performance laden in agreement with those folks to have their content on our platform as well. So how has the strike been affecting you or has it yet? <laughs> <laughs> so we, Black Oak TV, we started about three years ago coming out of the, or during the pandemic and we launched 2021, February, 2021. And we're still very small. Like we're a startup. We are, we've been funded a little bit, but we don't have multi-billion dollar budgets or revenues. And so we're not a part of the, of the negotiating arm that the WGA is striking with. And so all of our content is basically done directly with the individual producers them, themselves. Some are obviously a part of the WGA. And so certainly those folks aren't doing any work for us at the time being, but that's perfectly fine. I mean, the thing about us being fairly small is that we don't put out that much content yet. We hope that will change in the months and years to come, but we have a pretty good base of content that we have to work with for the time being. And I have pretty good faith that, that the strike won't go on too long or be too detrimental to what we're doing. But I'm very excited to see, I'm very interested in seeing what the negotiations end up bearing and 
you know, how both sides come to the conclusion here, because there are some really interesting mm -hmm. negotiating points that they're talking about. And it's really going to make a big difference in terms of how streaming goes over the next decade. It's really kind of overdue, right? It's a lot, you know, <laughs> it's been way too long down the tooth there for <laughs> it to happen, because I think it was pretty much the magnifying glass was shone on it with Scarlett Johansson, I think, with the, the Black Widow movie. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> So what are some of the stories that you would like to see more of from the Black community? Well, I think, I guess the question I would answer is, what are the stories that I want to see made from the Black community, for the Black community? And there's no one specific answers to start with like there's nothing like hey like I need this specific thing told at the end of the day for me it's just about more stories more representative stories things that you know we just seeing more and different sides of the black community I think for a long time in media we generally just saw a few what? stereotypes <laughs> of black people right it was yeah. either something dabbling in violence or drugs something with athletes the troubled figures or whatever it may be and granted over the last i'd say three to five years we started to see different things especially if, as there have been more scripted shows than ever being created we are starting to see a little more angle of black people being told so for me it's just really about keeping that up and continuing to do more things donald glover recently released a show on amazon prime called swarm which was more or less about a black female serial killer right like that's i wouldn't say if you had asked me before i saw that show i wouldn't have said hey that's the, that's the type of story we need to see more of but i'm glad he did that right i'm glad yeah. we had a, an anti-hero uh be a black female in a very creative and unique way and i think we just need more of that we need more ways to tell the story of Black people from a Black perspective so that we can see that we're, we're multifaceted. And obviously, I don't want to have a string of Black female serial killers out there, but my point is... <laughs> Although like, I'd like know, that, because that's I'm, my... I'm just saying, I, I love that I, I, kind of thing. I want to see us have the range, right? Like, we've had yeah. Tony Sopranos out there. We've had anti-heroes kill and things like that, and bad politicians and, and all of those things. So... I want to see Black characters and actors and writers be given that chance to explore all the depths of humanity from a Black perspective, because we have that range as, as well, and it hasn't been represented on mainstream TV since its beginning. Yeah, and then certainly directors and producers that are Black really make a difference. I mean, Jordan Peele has done something really amazing with the horror genre and yeah, it's just yeah. like everything he touches turns to gold now <laughs> <laughs> no yeah he's done some really interesting things and you know he's part he's of a comic the which makes it really even weirder right <laughs> right right i mean he's part of the vanguard that has helped push a lot of these unique stories forward and has shown mainstream hollywood hey you actually can do different things yeah. with Black people, like they don't have to be in these two or three boxes that you traditionally put them in. Your wife is a filmmaker. And is this is kind of one of the things that made you think about Black Oak TV? Or were you also writing screenplays along with your blog and media content? Yeah, I mean, my wife has certainly played a role in me founding Black Oak TV, her being a filmmaker, having created several films, obviously have been inspired by the work that she has done, have seen her creative process, have seen her on the sets. We have co-authored, co-created some small projects together as well. So I would certainly say she has definitely influenced the types of stories I like and see and write. And then, yeah, obviously my own writing along the way has been very, very much part of that. As I mentioned, I kind of grew up just dabbling here and there. I wrote a couple of books, nothing you can find anywhere at all, but in stories. And I had the blog and 
And yeah, my wife and I have created some things that I've or have produced some things that I've written and vice versa. So yes, yeah, she's been an incredible inspiration and a partner in a lot of the things that I've done for my media and business for perspective. We'll probably only do more things together, hopefully as, as Black Oak TV girls. I love that you're incorporating YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok creators. This alone makes Black Oak kind of unique. What other content are you excited about hosting? Well, there's a lot <laughs> on our long list of things that we would like to do. I would say in the immediate future, we're looking to do a lot more kids' content. There's just a dearth of that, even on the internet, even on YouTube and places like there's not enough kids' content focused on Black children, Black story. And so we're hoping to change that to some degree and start building in that direction. I want to do a lot more comedy, specifically stand-up comedy on the platform. I think there is a really big hole there. Some of the, obviously the big streamers have really gotten into promoting the big names and even bring some of the, the quote unquote middle-class stand-up comedians to the forefront and turning them into even bigger names. But I think there's a lot more that can be done there. I think there can be a big focus on Black comedians. And I think there's a real hole in the supply of Black stand-up comedy that is still un left unmet by the departure of things like Deaf Comedy Jam or Love Deaf Comedy uh, BET's Comic View. And so I think there's a big opportunity for something like that. So we're looking to go in that area as well. And then I just think a lot of talk and nonfiction, like we haven't really dabbled in that to any significant point. And I think the conversation that we're having and that you see across Twitter and other places all the time, I think there can be a home for, for that. And I think it can be done better than it is currently right now in a lot of places. And so we're trying to explore how we can be a home for that type of content as well, too. Tell us about some of those recent challenges. I mean, there's been a lot of challenges and we talked about some of them, but what are some of the more recent challenges that have been facing specifically Black creators? Well, when you say Black creators, what do you mean? You mean the, well, the digital creators, creators or... in general, like the filmmakers, the screen screenwriters, the producers. Yeah. Because there's a lot the main... of jobs out there, but. <laughs> I think the main thing, from, from um... my observation and experience, I think the main thing is just breaking in. Like, you know, some of, a lot of it is about who you know or who you can get to know, who you can get close to. Now, granted, I think you can really just try to push your way in and just create, 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 and try to force yourself upon people. But I think at some point, the realization is that people have to make ends meet and, and pay for their bills. And if you live in New York or LA, that's a very hard thing to do. And ultimately, you can get bogged down in trying to provide for yourself that where it will get in the way of you creating and kind of derail your career. And so I think it is having some specific channels that people know they can go through to get their chance. Because at the end of the day, the average Black person in comparison to the average white person is tends to not have those same connections to the industry, those same hands that can help them get the support and dig into it. It's just simple, simple numbers. And so I think developing these channels, these pathways for Black creatives to find their way into writer's rooms, onto set, or into acting even, I think it can really help because if you don't have the support from your family, if you don't have the savings account to really provide yourself in those early years where you need to be really creative and hustle and focus as much on this as possible. It's very hard to persevere. And I think that's been the great thing about social media is that yeah. it has been kind of a middle ground where perhaps you as a creative can marry your creativity with making money very instantly. Now, obviously it's not great money at the beginning and it doesn't always grow for everybody, but it is one way that kind of evens the playing field a little bit and allows some people that otherwise would have had no way to support their creative efforts 
to do so by being creative. And I think the more the platforms can support that, the better we'll see Black people start to thrive on social media and in Hollywood in general. Yeah. Best part about social media and places like YouTube is it gives voice to the voiceless who would not yeah. otherwise get a second look. Right, right. So what is your favorite part about being able to bring these stories to life? I mean, honestly, I think it's just that, right? I hear a lot of pitches. I talk to a lot of creatives, a lot of artists, filmmakers, writers who have these ideas and can't find anyone to support them, can't find anyone to finance it. And to occasionally, and I say occasionally because obviously I can't finance every story that comes our way, even the ones that we want to finance, but occasionally when you do find the match between what Black Oak TV's objectives are and a creator's objectives and goals, and to be able to just say, hey, let's go out and make this, like that's probably the biggest joy, like knowing that this piece of art that otherwise would have gotten made is going to be made now. That's the best, that's the best part. I think I like that more than, at least from a business perspective, I appreciate that more than even the actual release of the film. And I know that's when all, that's when you actually see the product of the work, but just knowing that, hey, this thing is going to come true. Like we're going to put the resources behind it. Like it's a really good feeling for me. I think it's a really good feeling for the artist. And it's what we're about, right? It's about us giving these stories an opportunity to be told. And so that that moment when all of everything comes together and we can kick off that process, that's a really good moment. Where would you like to see Black Oak TV go in the next few years? To the moon, to the moon, we're trying <laughs> to take off. I think our main goal it's in a very simple way, is just to be able to fund the stories that we want to tell in a profitable, sustainable way so that we can keep doing it. And once we get to that point, like that's where I will be happy. There will be a lot more to do after that. Like we want to tell amazing stories. We want to be in many different mediums. We want our platform to allow content creators and viewers and audiences to connect. We want to be able to do things in real life. So have, bring people together, whether it be for some type of private or public event, we want to do things like that. But I think the first thing on our list is to be able to tell X number of stories every single year and do that sustainably. Like right now, we're not a profitable company by any means. And so we're trying to get to the point where we're financing these stories. Those stories are bringing in the subscribers and the revenue that we need to finance more stories and just keep that flywheel going. And once we reach that point, that'll be a very critical point for us because it means that we can do so much more after that when we have that, that firm standing. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful that you were here and it's so much fun to learn more about your platform. All right. Well, thank you for having me, Debbie. I appreciate it.